Hello, this is Mike Holloman. I'm an air conditioning and refrigeration mechanic, uh, a mechanical engineer from uh, for about 45 years. Uh, got a background in uh, different types of refrigeration and uh, from all kinds of things, from aviation to the space center to uh, your walk-in cooler at your local deli. Uh, what we're talking about today is the TU-106 from the good folks there at North Park Innovations. And what we'll be doing today is, hello, Nick, I see you up there in, uh, at North Park. And uh, Nick's going to be pointing out different features on the TU-106. As I said, I'm, I'm from Florida and Nick's up there in the cold weather. And we're getting cold weather today in Florida, actually. We're down to the 60s. So we'll keep it that way. Um, but the TU-106 has a application for all types of refrigeration and, uh, and different uh, evaporators and uh, different application. But the basic refrigeration is, is something that is absolutely essential to this business. And with this trainer, um, you, you have a lot of different exercises that you can do starting uh, from the basics where you're gonna be measuring heat and temperature. And there's lab exercises that, that go through that in detail. And it gives the students a sense of, of what they're dealing with. And you can almost see the light go off with their, uh, the light bulb goes off in their head and they, they understand things that they may not have understood before. And the beauty of the TU-106 is you, you have a complicated piece of refrigeration equipment right in the classroom. So you can read about it, you can study it, you do your book work and you turn right around within a couple of feet, you can actually see it in action. Uh, you can interact with it uh, in the sense that you can use different type of expansion devices and um, you can measure different sensible and latent heats. There's exercises for that and um, detailed exercises. So as the students get a good handle on, on what these different things are, uh, they, can, they can apply it directly with the TU-106. Um, there are different exercises starting in the in the lab book with these these different uh, uh, data type recordings, and um, you get you get cause and effect going right there. And then you have uh, different refrigerants that have different characteristics, and this is also covered. And that's the beauty of using the. Um, different equipment that the good folks there at North Park Innovations have and can offer. Um, the beautiful thing about it, like I say, is you get it right in the classroom and it's uh, the equivalent of having a walk-in freezer right there. Um, so, but on your introduction, uh, you, you are um, basically absorbing heat from an from a area that is undesirable and you're putting it, the heat, you're removing it and putting it somewhere else that it's, uh, is, it is desirable. And that's the basics of all refrigeration and uh, air conditioning actually. But um, when, you, when you also look through the lab book, there, there are different types of schematics for the refrigeration. So you can actually get get your different colored pencils for the students and, and they can see exactly where those temperatures change and, and what all is involved. Um, Nick, you see the compressor there. Nick will point the compressor out. Um, sure. The nice commercial refrigeration compressor. And there's a reason uh, the efficiency of that compressor is uh, so it can handle the load that is going to be put upon it. Um, we have um, uh, 
different different type scenarios that you also can go through in the labs and the, you talk about uh, compressor issues and the different issues you can have with a compressor or, um, you know, where you lose efficiency and uh, different things cause that. A uh, couple of the highlights or you have a valve leak and it's, it's uh, hard for it to hold a pressure. When you have valves leaking, you're not having all the desired effect of that uh, compression cycle. Um, but you can have a discharge valve leak, you can have a suction valve leak, and you can have um, uh, the piston itself leaking, which, which you know, has rings around it and, uh, as it goes through its cycle. And there's exercises to where you can, you can go through the lab book there again, and uh, it's all laid out for you. Uh, they've done a really nice job as far as having different um, a variety of things that you can do and engage the students. And then, uh, Nick, there is uh, the, first, the first type expansion valve that, that's listed there is the capillary tube. And then sure. we get into the capillary tube selection when we're running the equipment. And we understand the, the basic uh, three types of valves, and they are the capillary tube and then the thermal expansion valve. And we have the automatic expansion valve. So those are, those are things that are critical on that unit. And that gives you a good sense of, well, what are these things? And what, what's the deal there? What do they do? And there again, there's, uh, there's excellent descriptions of what goes on with each one of those valves as you go through your laboratory um, experiments with the students. Um, and, and they highlight the different, different uh, features of each valve, what, what the asset and uh, what, what the good and the bad is basically with them. And more importantly, what the application is. Um, and you go through and you can, you can do the different, different type valves and uh, actually run the equipment and you'll see the different cause and effects. And there again, there's a, a schematic that you can, you can basically color in and you can see what happens and where. But the capillary tube they talk about, uh, basically that is what um, the, that's what moves the refrigerant because as the compressor starts, it automatically creates a low pressure and the capillary tube provides it basically on a high pressure. Once it goes through the capillary, it drops the pressure and it goes through the refrigeration cycle. Now, the, um, the automatic expansion valve, that's, that's another, another uh, part of the lab that it goes through and it talks about, you know, for different applications, for example, that wouldn't be a very good thing for, um, for a domestic refrigerator. Um, they, they tell you, well, when would you use it? And uh, what's it for? Well, the AXV we know is uh, to maintain a constant pressure in the evaporator. And, uh, and no, no refrigerant flows through uh, unless the pressure of the evaporator is reduced and that, that initiates the flow. Um, uh, there's a control spring in there that, that reacts when those pressures are changed. But there again, there's, there's pre-lab exercises and then you go through and you do the, the exercise and then, then you compare what you thought and what you learned. So awesome, awesome stuff. Um, and there again, each section of the chart has, or each section of the lab has a, a different uh, schematic that, that helps illustrate what's going on uh, with the system. Then you have the thermal expansion valve. That's up there, right, Nick? You yep. got that right there? Yeah. And, um, and that operates on the principle of superheat. And you go through there again, uh, once, you, once you understand, for example, 
the sensing ball and the sensing coming out of the evaporator. Um, and, and it allows more or less refrigerant into the evaporator. So it maintains that uh, degree of superheat. And that's, that's what the TXV is all about in maintaining uh, the most efficient operation. Now in Florida, most of the, most of the uh, air conditioning in Florida is the, uh, based on efficiency, is the thermal expansion valve. There's no question about it. That's the way to go uh, for most, most systems here. And our technicians are trained to, to properly charge a system uh, by superheat if it's a thermal expansion valve. And uh, you can come back in different conditions and it's still maintaining that superheat uh, basic range. Um, doesn't matter what time of year you come and check on it. Of course here, it's um, you want above 65 degrees when you charge a system uh, for air conditioning. And uh, of course we do a lot of reverse uh, cycle heat pumps in Florida because it's the most efficient way to heat a house. It's certainly cheaper to air condition your home than it is to heat it with resistive heat. Anyhow, it's an excellent thing to use in Florida. Um, but there again, there's, there's a fantastic uh, lab experiment. So there's, there's, you write down your different, different temperatures and pressures and, and you go through the whole cycle again. And there again, you have another schematic refrigeration uh, chart and, uh, and you go through the whole basic thing. Um, it's, it's constantly, constantly um, revealing something new and something different and something that'll entertain the, the troops. Um, then you get into the commercial refrigeration and you go, well, okay, well, what, what can be commercial refrigeration? Well, um, that's gonna, that's gonna, the devil's in the details and how you handle different uh, commercial refrigeration systems is uh, all the difference in the world. Um, you have, uh, sometimes multiple evaporators. Uh, you, you have different type systems. Uh, you have different compressors. Uh, you have um, the same thing with uh, possible problems with the compressor uh, with the different, different types of, um, of leaks as the uh, compressor loses its efficiency. Um, but there again, there's more exercises for the commercial refrigeration. And then you get into the, the defrost cycle. Now, when you get into a heavy um, low temp and we're talking minus 10 degrees walk-in freezer, well, that presents a lot of problems in itself, trying to keep something that big, that cold especially in the, a humid environment uh, because you have to get product in and out. And a lot of times it requires leaving the door open while you use a hand truck to bring in food and put it on the shelf. Um, so there's a need to get rid of the moisture that is introduced into the system and it maintain that low temperature. And of course, you have uh, uh, different, different uh, challenges when you do that. One of the biggest challenges is every time you open the door, you introduce humidity. You now you need to get that humidity out because where is it going to end up? It's going to end up on that evaporator coil. Uh, you have the fans running all the time and, and it's a low temp. So you're going to be building ice on that coil. So you have to go through a defrost cycle and get rid of that. So when you go through a uh, uh, very low temperature situation and you have to go through a defrost cycle, you set it up as to, I believe there's a defrost cycle uh, timer on there, right, Nick? Yep. 
to our defrost timer is right here. Right. Now on the defrost timer, you have usually different, different times a day. You can set them up on the average, let's say every six hours, you'll go through this, this, uh, this defrost cycle. And in basically what happens there in a walk-in freezer, let's say, uh, because that can be one of the most challenging as far as the technician goes. Uh, you have, most systems would have a, uh, a solenoid, and that is what turns the compressor on and off, the actual solenoid. But how does that work? Well, when the solenoid um, is in a position of open, the system is gonna run. But what, what happens, the defrost controller will allow the, the, the solenoid to close. Therefore, it, it pumps down the, the refrigerant in the system. So you have, you have to have a place to put all that Freon. So there's, what do you have there to take care of that, Nick? So down here, we've got um, our receiver and our accumulator. So the accumulator before the compressor, that'll store any, any excess refrigerant. Right. And as you know, when you first start a walk-in freezer, it's 80 degrees, let's say, uh, you need to get it down to minus 10. So when you first start that system, you're going to need a lot more refrigerant to take care of that load to get all that heat to the outside. So you're absorbing the heat and, and relocating it to the outside. And as you get closer to minus 10 degrees, you don't need as much refrigerant, right? So it's stored for you. It's there when you need it. But to initiate the defrost, I'm just gonna say this, um, different systems, depends on the manufacturer, they do it different ways, but Basically, the, the uh, solenoid restricts the flow of refrigerant and the compressor goes off on low pressure. Now, this happens simultaneously. What happens is it shuts the compressor off by low pressure and um, it also turns the evaporator fans to the off position. And it also um, turns the heater on that heats up the evaporator. And uh, from that point, the temperature is being sensed on the evaporator. There's, there's a temperature sensor that's mounted on there and it goes to what we call a defrost termination switch. And on the defrost termination switch, it does a couple of things, but it's sensing the temperature, okay? So when it is in defrost, the compressor's off, the heater's on, the evaporator fans are turned off, okay? And it stays that way as it melts off the accumulated moisture on the evaporator. Once that happens, then um, it energizes the solenoid. Now that defrost termination switch also says, okay, we're at temperature we're above freezing, there couldn't be any ice left. So we're gonna let that refrigeration cycle begin. So it activates the solenoid, pressure rises, compressor comes on, it's no longer off on low, low pressure, right? So it starts, it gets the, the evaporator freezing. And in the meantime, the defrost termination switch holds the fans off, doesn't let them come on until it feels the temperature of the evaporator has gone well below freezing. Once that happens, then the evaporator fans start and the cycle is returned basically uh, uh, back, back to freezing. And until the next six hours, it all happens again. And uh, of course, you have a, uh, a type of uh, resistive heater that's wrapped around the the line that takes that, that melted uh, water basically off the evaporator and it, it allows it 
uh, it heats the conduit, if you will, or the, the drain to the outside because it, uh, otherwise you'd have just uh, it going into a, a very cold temperature and freezing in the pipe. So you have to heat the pipe basically to get that condensation outside the freezer. And uh, there you go. But the different control systems are there. Now, Nick, what type of control do you have when you initiate the defrost on the TU-106? So when I initiate the defrost with yes. the defrost timer? Well, the defrost timer initiates the defrost. And then that basically does what we're talking about, right? It, it right, turns right. the compressor off and it would turn a, a type of heater on and go through the cycle. Like I said, different manufacturers do it different way. I, I gave you the, the defrost termination switch, um, which uh, really, if you, if you ever walked into a freezer and you see these stalactites hanging from the ceiling and you see ice on the floor and you see ice on the product that just got put in there the day before, but it's got ice built up. You know, what's going on here? Um, it's freezing, it's making ice, uh, everything's working that way. But if the defrost termination switch fails, then it would allow those fans, let's say, to come on before it reached a freezing temperature creating basically a fog bank inside that uh, walk-in freezer and it would freeze the moisture as it uh, was accumulating. Um, anyhow, that's, that's for the technician to learn. Uh, so lots of, lots of good things to learn on, on this system, the, T, the TU-106. Um, but when the, when the temperature increases, uh, the different type systems will, will turn off or turn on. Now, Nick, what type system is on there that controls that compressor to turn it off and to turn it on? Is there a temperature so the, sensor there? What we're, what we're running on is the dual pressure control, so the pressure high and low control. pressure cutout. Right, and the pressure control, so basically it would, uh, uh, that's going into, uh, they're, they're, they're common, we call them a pin switch, it's made by pin, um, which usually the way it works is it'll, it'll uh, basically, it'll turn on at a certain pressure and it'll turn off at a certain pressure. And what you need to do is look at the type refrigerant that you're using and you look at the temperature that you that equals the pressure. And that's how you would set up that pressure switch. So as the pressure rises, the compressor would come on. And as the pressure drops, the pressure would go off. Now, on that switch, you have another selection, which is a differential, right, Nick? That's right, yep. Yeah, so on the differential, what it would do is you set the differential for what temperature you want it to come on and off at, you set the difference, okay? So as it, as it rises, let's say two degrees, then the pressure equal that two degrees, then that's what you'd have the, the on set to. And, and once it goes below that by two degrees, then that's where you would have the pressure set for that refrigerant for it to go off. Um, and there again, uh, you might have more controls on there. Nick, do you have a high pressure, low pressure, oil pressure switch on the TU-106? Um, just with the I-manifold pressure probes that we have, um, but we have our dual pressure control and um, we're just operating the liquid line through the solenoid valves um, and those are running to our electronic temperature controls. So one for okay. each evaporator. Okay, electronic temperature control at the evaporator. And that's, that's, that's a, uh, a perfect way that, that you, can, you can convert temperature to pressure. And, um, and there it is. 
But that being said, uh, there again, you could have a variety of, of uh, pressure switches. You could have low pressure, you could have high pressure, you could have oil pressure, um, but usually without exception, all of those switches are wired in a control circuit that is in series and pretty much is without exception. So if any of one of those pressure sensors activated, it's going to turn that compressor off and protect the system. Um, but there again, there's, there's the lab exercises again, going through what we just discussed. And, uh, and you have all of that available on the TU-106. And, and it's in, in the lab uh, book work, which they have, uh, you set the cut-in pressure, you set the cut-out pressure, and you set the differential. Um, and, and that's all a part of the learning curve. And you have that thoroughly covered in the workbook. Uh, there again, each section has a different uh, schematic for the refrigerant circuit. So you can, you can visually see, see that and it reinforces with the students. Um, but, and, and then we go into the compressor and uh, you, know, you, you revisit the compressor a couple of times and, and because that is basically the heart of the system. And when you understand how the heart works, it's exactly like the compressor. Uh, your heart works on the same principle. As it beats, it creates a high pressure, but at the same time, the fact that it squeezes it out, it creates a suction, it creates a lower pressure. And that's what you get at the doctors every time you go and they, they take your blood pressure. That's what they're looking at. Well, what they've done here is they're, they're able to put this up on, a, on a, a visible scale to where you can look at the high pressure and you can look at the low pressure uh, while it's operating. So very cool stuff. Um, but there again, going through the compressor, there's, there's lots of exercises in the lab uh, where you, you actually go through and, and you, you learn the value here also of using your meter, your, your hand tools. For example, your, your volt ohm meter, uh, with that volt ohm meter and with the uh, resistance setting, you can, you can pretty much uh, tell electrically what's going on. Now, mechanically is, is one thing, electrically it's another. So you can, you can with that ohm's resistance, you can tell a lot about what's going on inside that uh, winding. So you can get the health of the compressor that way. Um, but when you are able to analyze that compressor, that's the mark of a great mechanic because if you don't understand these basics, um, then you're gonna be, you're gonna probably be coming up short when it comes to troubleshooting the system. And the one thing that we don't wanna see in, in, in the field is a callback because, well, we miss some. We hate that, but it happens, but we try not to let that happen. Um, but you have to be able to analyze the situation, both mechanical and electrical. And this is all, all visited in the, in the labs that, that they reinforce that on the TU-106. And then they start with the uh, start components. And what type start components do we have there, Nick, for the compressor? Right, so here's everything um, in, a, in a small little bundle electrically that's gonna go to an electric box on top of the compressor. So in this portion can be pulled off to do all of your testing. And we've got a little wiring diagram to show the different, the starting capacitor, the potential relay. And, it, and it's all color coded too. Right, and 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 the potential relay um, is is something that they they will also get very familiar with. And when do you need a potential relay? And uh, um, you have a current relay for a split phase, right? And so you'll have a, a 
potential relay, which that, that does have there, and that's for a capacitor start motor. And that's basically the difference. And um, there's, there's detail there again in the lab as you go through the book. Um, but you'll have your, your actual start winding and your run winding resistance and, and you document all of that as you go. Um, but let's say you have on, on a commercial refrigeration, you have multiple evaporators, which you will have in this case, right, Nick? You got two evaporators up there. Yeah. Okay. So now you ask yourself, well, okay, um, well, how do you control two evaporators? I mean, it, maybe uh, how does that work? You know, what, what's the deal there? How do you control them? Why would you want two evaporators on, on one, one compressor? Well, it makes a lot of sense. But then you get into the fact of the details of how do you control that when you have uh, uh, multiple evaporators? Well, in a commercial system, you're going to have that. And, and you may have, uh, for example, in, in a... Uh, in a grocery store, you have a display case, and the display case has has several cases that run off of the same compressor, and yet all of those cases may have the same desired temperature. So that's how you can control that. Um, but let's say you have a uh, a refrigerator and you have a walk-in freezer on the same compressor circuit. Could you do that? Absolutely, you can do that. And there again, the beauty of the TU-106, it removes all doubt in exactly how you go about doing that. And for example, you, you go through an exercise where you might have display cases, like I say, running off of the same uh, unit. Uh, and you have the exercise that goes through, that goes through all of that. Um, but if you have different evaporators, uh, temperature requirements, then you're going to get into, you've got to control that evaporator. And um, how would you do that, Nick? Isn't there some, some uh, solenoids on there? Right. So with our electronic temperature controls, the temp sensor is at the end of it. We can place that in front of the coil to, to open and shut our solenoid valves here in the middle. Okay, outstanding. And um, so what you can do then is you have, do you have two temperature controls that control solenoids? Yeah. Okay, well, there it is. That way you can set the different temperatures that turn on and off the flow of refrigerant to the different evaporators. And it's basically just that simple. Um, so when, when they reach the desired temperature, the solenoid is, is activated, shutting the system, shutting the flow of the refrigerant off on, on the system. And uh, yeah, it's cool stuff. And there again, it's all, it's all um, illustrated in the lab manual itself. So you, you, have, you have a way to document and to take the students through that, through that uh, journey, if you will, through the commercial refrigeration. Then you have something else. Um, do you have uh, the heat exchanger on, on that unit, Nick? So over here we have the heat exchanger and then we also have a bypass to flow around it. Okay, so now you go, wait a minute, what, what's a heat exchanger all about? Well, it, there again, it takes you through the whole process and, and you'll learn on that journey where, where the heat exchanger um, is used and, and what, it's, what it's used for. Um, but it's, it's usually uh, used exclusively on a commercial system to increase the efficiency. And that's what it's all about. It's all about efficiency. And um, 
uh, once you once you understand the the efficiency part and and well how does how does that work you get well um, how do you think that might work that's wrapped around what that's a liquid line wrapped around the evaporator right isn't that right Nick yep so right around the suction line that yeah. liquid line does a bunch of bunch of spirals right yeah. connected to it. And, and what that does is that, that gives increased refrigeration um, because the temperature of the high side liquid is cooled below saturation. Uh, so the heat's absorbed from the high side liquid latent. Um, and it, it, it has a greater capacity to absorb heat in the evaporator. And that's the whole purpose of it. Like I say, that's that's usually a commercial application. But there again, the student's going to be, it, it takes about five years really in the field to see most all things that are out there. And that's if you're lucky. Uh, I see new things. I see new developments. I see, for example, this TU-106. How awesome is that? You can bring the whole world into your classroom right there. Great stuff. Um, but they have not left a stone unturned when it comes to uh, what they have to offer and, and how, it's, how it's operated. But there again, there's another exercise for that proving the very thing that we're talking about with that, that heat exchange. And, um, and then uh, you have a constant pressure valve on there too, don't you, Nick? Yeah. So the the AXV. Okay, and um, well, couple couple chapters back, they were talking about you know what the um, the evaporators running at the same temperature. But uh, for example, if you want a different uh, different temperature, uh, like with a freezer and a walk-in cooler running off of the same compressor, how would you do that? Well, oh. this is where you can put this, this uh, valve on the warmer evaporator. Whatever the warmer is, that's where you would put the, uh, the, this valve. And there's an exercise to go through that also. Uh, the CPV, the constant pressure valve. And there again, there's exercises to where you can can, you can go through and experience that um, and you document that and uh, pretty much there again you have you have another uh, another case of the refrigerant circuit where you can document it and you can see the temperature change and, and the students involvement with that but um, right. that pretty much is an introduction to the to the TU106 highly recommend you bringing that into the classroom. So another thing, Mike, just to touch on with the um, variable speed fans at both evaporators and the condenser. Outstanding. And, and the value of that is, could, is, is incredible when you come to understand what's happening and how you can affect the efficiency of a system for example, you can duplicate uh, uh, an evaporator with low airflow. Um, and where do you get low airflow? Well, you might have some animals that, you know, most people have a cat or a dog or several. Uh, well, what happens there is, is um, it might end up on the evaporator. And, uh, or if you forget to change that filter, well, it'll show itself. And this is where it shows itself on that evaporator. So that, and the same thing with the condenser, you can variable speed, slow that speed down and you can duplicate the situation of this is, this is what it looks like. And you can see it real time with the system running and you can watch the pressures as this happens. Um, and you can do the same thing if you have 
a dirty coil on the outside, you're going to have the, the it impact the operation because you, you're not going to have the cycle of refrigerant performing as it's designed. That, that's an excellent, excellent thing. Thank you for that, Nick. What, what did I miss there? I think that was about it. <laughs> that's about it. Okay. Nick, let's, yeah, we could, we could definitely demonstrate, for example, um, uh, take your pick on, on what you would like to turn on. Let's turn on something and uh, let's, let's go to an exercise, let it run for a couple of minutes, and then we'll, ver we'll, we'll change the speed of the evaporator to see the effect. Okay, so then why don't we just because it's going to take a couple more minutes to get the UVAP number two to come on with that, with the um, defrost um, delay. The, so if we just run EVAP one with a TXV, oh, we don't really need to see me valve off and start up, right? We can just, we'll be looking at my, our pressures and temperatures. We can reduce the airflow and then you'll see that saturation temperature drop, the pressure. I mean, is that... I think that'd be an excellent exercise. Okay. Let's do that. All right. Well, Mike, I can go through and we'll start this thing up in just a basic air conditioning refrigeration mode, just running one evaporator. So I'll go through and close certain valves to create the configuration that I want. Okay. And are we going to, which, which expansion device are we going to use on this, Nick? I'll use the TXV. Okay, the thermal expansion valve. We're going for the most efficient, okay? And that'll be a good illustration when we see it get less efficient. So now I'll need to call for Cool here. Okay, and you're activating the electronic temperature set, right? That's right. So there's my compressor on. My solenoid valve is open, so that's going to allow refrigerant to flow through here. So I've got my fan speed down kind of low. I'll turn that all the way up. So that yeah. we can we'll go be ahead able to and turn it yeah turn it up like it's fully started i uh immediately saw the pressure change and we'll run it as efficient and as designed then, yeah, we'll, so then mess we'll and we can see on our gauge set here we'll see our saturation temperature start to drop so once we get a stabilized coil then we can mess with that airflow to see the effect that that temperature has Excellent. So if we look at all four of these sight glasses here, that's everything that we've got in play. So coming out of our compressor through our discharge line, we can see that we have a hot gas entering the condenser. And down at the outlet, we can see that we have a solid column of liquid refrigerant flowing through that and into our receiver. So if we continue to follow that line set, we'll go through our filter dryer, then through the solenoid valve, through the flow meter, and into one of the three metering devices. So then I'm coming through my TXV, entering the evaporator, and then coming out of the evaporator. So now we should have our low temperature, low pressure, vapor with a trace of oil going back to the compressor. And we're using 134A, correct? We're using 134A. So right here, we're, we're bouncing between 41, 43 degrees at our EVAP coil. So if I slow that fan speed, I'm just going to slow it all the way down so that we can really see that effect. So in real time, we'll see that saturation temperature drop. Our pressures are going to drop. And now it'll start to function at a lot lower temperature. What a different in, difference in efficiency. 
Right, so now you can see we've almost, we've lost about 20 degrees um, at our coil. So is there anything else that we, that you want to see operating, Mike? Well, um, that pretty much describes what, what happens in, um, in, in effect. You're going to probably be freezing the evaporator before you know it, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's, that's one thing that, you know, I would uh, like to illuminate. Um, but there again, the, the 106, we could go through each, of, uh, each expansion device. Uh, we could spend a lot of time just doing that. Okay, as you can see, the effects of the low airflow on the evaporator is going to soon result in that evaporator freezing. And um, there again, it illustrates the problem of low airflow, and we can see it on the iConnect. We can see it as it happens. Um, and Nick is standing there looking at it, and it's probably starting to ice up, huh, Nick? Yeah, oh, it's starting to freeze. <laughs> okay, well, that's the that's the uh, learning point of the variable speed on the evaporator, and both evaporators have variable speed, and or do they, Nick? Yep, both do. Both do, and and how about the condenser? That does as well. So we oh. wanted to see that increase in head pressure. We, we could. There it is. Okay, so there we go. So I'll I'll end this TU one oh six with that illustration and and the uh, the illustrations are boundless. It's up to your imagination how you can use the TU-106. But uh, there again, my name is Mike Holloman. And if I can be of any further assistance, please contact me uh, through North Park Innovations. And I'd be glad to address any questions or concerns you may have. Um, thank you for your time and uh, wish you good luck with your instruction.